I'm Amber um, McReynolds, and I was the Director of Elections for the City and County of Denver for many years, uh, about seven before I left last August. Um, and then I w ran elections and was in the office for over 13 years. Uh, so I started in Denver back in 2005. And what I would say, just to start off the conversation, and then um, and we're going to kind of just talk through all of the issues relating to elections and security. But back in 2005, when I started in Denver, uh, what I found was an office that was, uh, did not have good technical systems, was not integrated with the city and county of Denver's kind of technology structure. Uh, we had different versions of Microsoft on like everybody's computers, like there was no consistency. Um, and then elections generally, there was a, a mentality that we'd done it a certain way for 30 years and we're gonna keep doing it a certain way. Um, and that was really, I believe, detrimental to voters. So we, what I tried to do was build a culture and an organization that uh, focused on putting the voter first and, and then we also, one of the things we did, we had uh, one half IT person in 2005 in Denver, and now there's a team of five and a half. So it grew dramatically, and they're all dedicated to elections. Uh, and one thing that Denver also uh, today is fully integrated with the city and county of Denver's technical structure, which was not how it was in 2005, and frankly, not how most local election offices operate across the country today. So, you know, we went through this big transition, but most election offices are trying to do this on their own. They're trying to run their own websites, and they really don't have the capacity um, as what they would if they went and worked with their jurisdictions. Uh, the other thing that kind of happened that was transformational in Colorado, uh, which has really set us on pace to be one of the top states for security, is we transitioned from 64 different county voter registration databases starting in 2006, and we implemented that in May of 2008. And I'll pause there for a second because May of 2008 is three months before uh, a primary election in 2008 and five months, or, well, less than that, four months before uh, what we kicked off in terms of the presidential election in 2008. So Colorado as a state implemented a full statewide system in 2008 within about six months of the election. Um, but the key element there is we went from basically 64 databases that didn't talk to each other to one database where we could implement online registration, we could do same day registration, we could do vote centers, we could add all of these things and the Secretary of State's office had an ability to then better secure that one system. Uh, so that's where I'm going to kind of turn it over to Judd because uh, 2009 and, and forward, this sort of 10-year period uh, that we've now gone through is, is really what made Colorado one of the best states to vote, one of, one of the most secure places to vote, but it happened over a pretty long period of time and actually quite a few secretaries of state. So that's one thing that we're also going to talk about is kind of the um, the need for civil service and sort of what that looks like separate and apart from sort of who's in and who's out in terms of the elected position. So with that, Judd. So my name is Judd Choate. I'm the state election director. I work for the Secretary of State's office. Um, I'm on my fourth secretary now, uh, two Democrats and two Republicans. Uh, so I guess that means I have staying power or I've been really lucky. Um, but it also sort of speaks to the culture in the office. The office has done a very good job of uh, re retaining people, keeping continuity across administrations, and prioritizing the kinds of things that Amber was just talking about. Um, I want to dispel something right away, though, and that is that um, Colorado, while thought of as uh, one of the best, if not the best, um, elections generally state in the country, and then also one of the most secure, if not the most secure, election state in the country, we didn't get there because we're so brilliant. I'd love to say that we're brilliant. Um, we're a lot smarter than everybody else. I think actually it was um, the way, our, the design of our system and um, the continuity of our team and the fact that we have built in um, IT professionals in the office that makes us kind of special. The um, 2008 conversion was a big deal. Uh, we um, 
back in Donetta Davidson's time as Secretary of State. She was Secretary between 1999 and 2005. Uh, she had the opportunity of we could have been absorbed into OIT or we could create or stay independent of that and have our own IT team. We decided to stay independent. I think our OIT does a very good job. The, the thing is though, by having an independent IT of our own in the office, we were able to prioritize the things that were really necessary for our office. And um, we built that team. It's now over 40 people. Trevor Timmons is right here. He's our CIO. Um, and we have more people in IT than we have in elections. And we have more people in IT than we have in business, which are the two operating wings of the office. And that sort of demonstrates how important IT is to our daily functions. And from the fact that we had people in the office, we were able to build security into every component that we grew in the office. Um, like, for instance, online voter registration and many of the SCORE development. SCORE is our statewide voter registration database. As we develop SCORE and as we uh, brought development in-house, we were able to build security into each one of those development um, cycles. So now uh, we have a very secure system. We did things like two-factor authentication back in 2013. We were the first state in the country to have two-factor authentication to get into our statewide voter registration database. That um, you know, put us in a very different position than most states in 2016 when the reports were coming out about Russia and they were scrambling to be able to create that. Um, we now have what you might more ac uh, accurately call multi-factor authentication because there are a number of different ways in which you can securely get into our both internal systems and then into our statewide voter registration database. And it is a series of gateways. And so, uh, and we track the use of all of the uh, parts of that database. So. Um, when I'm in the SCORE database, the voter registration database, they can see the work that I'm doing. They can track, Trevor can sit at his desk and go, what is Judd up to? Well, what that does is it allows us to go back and understand who did what, what changes were made. And that can be really good for our county partnership because a county may not realize that they've got a person that's really not doing the job all that well. We can see when something pops up, we can see who is that person. We can tell the county, hey, you got somebody here that did this one thing really poorly, you might want to go back and spot check some other things that they did. Turns out, well, they're doing a lot of stuff wrong. We should really put them into a different position or maybe find them a different trade in some other um, part of the Denver economy. Um, so there's, um, there are lots of advantages from having that sort of built-in technology that we could grew as, the, you know, um, as, as we developed our election system. So one of the great things about our system, I think, is the fact that we have such a great state-county partnership. So uh, the county has done a lot of the things I just described, but the, county, uh, or the state has done those. Counties have done a whole bunch of other things on their own. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I mean, first, when we converted over to the statewide system, uh, there was basically all the count, a lot of county officials were brought in to talk about the design, be very involved in sort of creating um, what the statewide system would become, and that continued. So there was this county user group. Uh, that is rare. I, I can tell you, I, with my new role, I'm traveling around the country speaking to lots of states about policy reform and election reform, and I am always very happy to fly back into Denver International Airport. Um, and I very, feel very lucky that I'm a voter here and not elsewhere. Um, so. Uh, but what I would say is the, the counties played a big part in what the design looked like. Um, and they've, been, they've continued to be partners and they've continued to be involved. And there were you know, various monthly calls with all the county officials. There's a, there's, much, there's a great integration with sort of the IT team and the staff at the secretary's office with county officials and working together to prioritize what makes sense to do. Um, the other thing I would say on that, and I would add to, I think, why we've been successful, is if you look at a lot of other states, they've got systems that were not designed for their particular voting model. So they're sort of stuck with, you know, whether it's polling places, early voting, 
no, you know, no excuse absentee or excuse absentee, but they've kind of been stuck with systems over time and they've tried to basically fit their processes into the technology. And I know a lot of you in the room as being technologists and what have you, that's the wrong way to do it. That's the backwards way to do it. So one thing that I think happened here, and, and I would say that it was strategic, others would say it was lucky. Uh, either way, lucky, strategic, but we passed a major reform in 2013 where we basically reformed the entire way that we vote in Colorado. So you get your ballot automatically at home now. We have vote centers where you can go to any location um, to register to vote on election day or vote in person. Uh, so voters have like three, four weeks to engage in the process and it isn't this government assigns you to the polling location on one particular day and that's where you have to go and you have to drive home from work and be there by that particular time by an hour. So we designed the system to be voter centric and, and improve the voting experience. And then what sort of happened then over those next few years was Trevor and his team designed basically a check-in tool that would be used at the vote centers. So we were able to basically implement a new policy, implement a new process, and then design the technology to fit that. So Colorado is operating at, at a much higher level than a lot of other states um, in this regard because that sequence was done right. We adjusted policy, we designed a process, and then we built technology. And that extends actually to the voting system. So after Trevor built the web score, I keep saying Trevor because he's right here. Um, <laughs> After uh, WebScore was implemented and built, so that's basically the check-in process uh, that you see at the vote centers, and then we also have the statewide voter registration system. So those two things that kind of interact with voters. Then in 2015, um, the other deadline we were facing was to implement risk-limiting audits. Uh, and what we found kind of over that 2013-2014 timeframe as we were talking about this is pretty much none of the voting systems that were operating across the state could actually do risk limiting audits. They didn't have the proper data exports, they didn't have the proper methods within the systems to actually do the audits that we were gonna be required and mandated to do uh, by 2015. So uh, right around after we passed the policy, uh, I actually started talking to our the vendor that Denver had and they showed me kind of their new uh, systems that they were gonna be rolling out. And I said, we're not gonna buy any of that. And they were like, what? And I said, we, we, we want software, we want COTS, we want off the shelf components. We don't wanna spend $4,000 on touchscreen voting machines that have no other purpose and are out, to, out of date very soon. We really wanna have off the shelf components so that we can better support them. They're cheaper, they're more efficient. We can upgrade them easier. Um, so Dominion is the, is the main provider of systems in Colorado. And they said, okay, let's work together and, and design it. And so they started working with us. They started talking to other county officials about what would work. Uh, and Denver piloted this new system and then eight other counties piloted five different systems in 2015. And we were able to basically select a system that would work for all of our needs. So we got a voting system also designed for the policy. So literally, all the technology now in Colorado, almost, has been designed to fit the policy and fit the process and not the reverse. Uh, so I'll, I, I don't know if yeah. you want to talk about that, but I think that's also a, a unique aspect that we deal with here. Yeah, so. and risk limiting audits in particular is something that you all might find interesting. So uh, we had a county clerk, um, actually a couple of county clerks, but one in particular, that back in 2008 and 2009 worked with legislators, and we have many legislators in the room, who some of whom might have been involved in those uh, discussions, um, who um, devised this idea of risk-limiting audits as a policy for uh, Colorado state elections. And risk-limiting audits are audits where we are auditing whether the system, so the, the scanners that are, uh, are, are, we're feeding those ballots into, we're auditing whether that system is tabulating those ballots correctly. And we're not doing it in batches. So we're not at the end of 50 ballots going back and looking, well, there were 41 ba uh, votes for this person and nine votes for this person and uh, you, organizing it by groups. Uh, we know how a particular scanner scanned a particular ballot. 
And we don't know whose ballot it is, but we know every single ballot and how every single ballot was scanned. And we have that log, and then the risk limiting audit, the software, goes and says, okay, for us to, to uh, have a 95% confidence uh, that this uh, outcome was correct, we need to look at 122 of these ballots, and it has to be these ballots so that we know um, that we've captured the winner-loser criteria properly. We've also captured some other races properly so that we can analyze the other races that are on those ballots. And we know at the end of that that we can have confidence that the right winner was determined. And as you do the audit, if a county official or the, the county auditing team makes a mistake in inputting what they see visually, and that doesn't match up with what the system had, then um, if that mistake makes it more likely that the outcome was incorrect, our calculus may very well tell them, hey, look, that was great that you did those 122 ballots, but you're going to have to do another 84 because we're really not sure right now because you had one of those wrong. And they have to go back through and do those 84. And let's say they get one or maybe even two of those wrong. We gotta, we, we're going to have to pull another 65 of them. And you'll do round after round after round until the system says, yep, we've looked at enough ballots now that we believe that the outcome was correct for that race in that county. And we also, uh, many counties, like Denver so far, every time that they've done it, um, can get every single ballot right every single time. We know with 100% confidence that the system reviewed every single one of those ballots properly. And we know that that outcome was almost certainly correct. Um, if a county makes an error, though, we go through a process whereby we are analyzing to make sure that that error isn't an error in the system, but it's more of a tabulation error. It's a review error. And I would just jump on my soapbox for just a second. If anybody ever tells you that hand count is better than a scanner count, that process demonstrates the fallacy of that because just having a human look at 63 of them or a pair of humans, actually four humans because you have the two bipartisan team that's doing the review and then you often have two county officials looking over their shoulders, right? That team might get one or two of those wrong over the course of 63 ballots, whereas that scanner got every single one of those right. You know, and over the course of a thousand different scans, they're probably going to get a thousand right or maybe 999 of those right. So uh, hand counts take a long time and they're you know, very expensive and frankly they are riddled with potential error. And so the best scenario is what we do, which mm -hmm. is you uh, do the scanner and then you do your risk limiting audit. And we do a risk limiting audit. Colorado is the only state in the country that has that um, level of auditing. Um, other counties and states are clamoring to get there and you know, calling us all the time in um, talking to Jennifer Morell, who was the Arapahoe County Elections Director and has been a leader in audits nationally. Um, she's getting calls every day trying to get um, different jurisdictions on board with RLAs. So um, that's a big advantage that we have in our system as well. Jennifer and I need a private jet. Oh, that would to be To get cool. around. <laughs> Can I get in on that? Yeah. Um, um, so <laughs> another thing, so uh, ju jumping to, we also have a great partnership with uh, the feds. So the federal government has also partnered with us and frankly, prior to 2016, so again, Colorado is sort of ahead of the curve here. The fact that we have Trevor's team and um, a security team within um, our uh, Colorado Department of State um, IT division, they had already reached out uh, to Sean at DHS and to his entire team. We've got the um, Colorado Fusion Center. We've got the Colorado National Guard. They were literally in our office in 2016, 2017 for those elections, like literally in our Aspen room, which is a conference room, doing verification of, you know, is the system working properly? What can we do to make sure to optimize the operations of this or that system that was necessary for those election days? And those were times before we even really knew that there was a problem in the 2016 election or that there were ways in which we could partner with the federal government after that. So there's been a big, um, uh, advantage from having those relationships and having them early. 
Yeah, and that uh, that brings up another um, sort of issue, you know, that we experienced in Denver. I mean, the, Denver has built a pretty incredible cyber team. They've redone a lot of their infrastructure for all the city systems, not just elections, but all. Uh, and the reason that they did that is they um, they actually got attacked quite significantly uh, years ago, long long time ago now. But it brought the city to its knees for a long period of time, and so they recognized very quickly that they had to, you know, put up, get their defenses up, rebuild some of their systems, and think about this differently. And at the time, you know, we were we were definitely coordinating with our technology services department. But I said to them, you know, I really want you to include elections in this, and so we started doing you know, the penetration testing and kind of all of the audits, and we would have outside auditors. We'd also have the auditor's office and their technical team uh, analyze all of our systems prior to every election. Um, and we started doing that starting back in 2012. So a lot of this, like we, you know, you hear about 2016 and Russia to Judd's point, but mm -hmm. you know, you go back even that far and Denver was doing a lot of that. Um, we were working with the state quite a bit on SCORE and like we had our team in contact with them um, because we knew that if we go down and all of that, and, and there was an issue in 2016, um, that we would have issues on election day. So we were doing everything we could to try to be proactive with that. Um, and then, you know, that experience and like, you know, the work that we did with the states, 2016 came and went, um, and there was investment from Harvard Kennedy School and the Belfer Center in creating basically playbooks for campaigns, for election officials, for other folks in the space. And they actually brought their team out to Denver and to Colorado and spent two days with the Secretary of State's office with, with Denver and going through everything that we had done. And the playbook today um, is, is pretty much, I think, everything that we were doing already in Colorado that they've now trained everyone else around the country to do. Um, and, and Denver and a lot of the officials around Colorado were very involved in the tabletop exercises that the Belfer Center put on. I was a moderator for one of them at Harvard last year. We did one here. The Secretary of State's office coordinated an amazing tabletop top exercise last year. Um, and what that does is really trains officials, trains everyone on what to expect because election day is not an easy day. And there aren't many government offices that basically serve all of their customers within a 30-day period, right? So we basically have to provide service to every constituent in every jurisdiction within that 30-day period. There's not other structures and businesses and, and what have you that do that. Um, so part of the reason we do a lot of this training in the off-season is to prepare for those things. Um, and the final thing I'll say before I'm sure Judd's going to weigh in on that and talk about the tabletop piece uh, is that, you know, election day and kind of the, the sort of weeks before that, the way that our system works out here is we send a ballot out to every voter three weeks prior. So voting starts and it's, it's dispersed. It's all in your houses or in your workplaces or wherever you might be voting your ballot. And then we have a smaller set of vote centers. <laughs> Prior to that, with hundreds of polling places around the state, voting, precinct scanners, tabulation happening in each one of those, voting machines and all of that equipment being out there, um, and all of that concentration on election day generates risk and puts a giant target on election day. And so if you look at like a state like New York, or I'll, throw, I'll talk about Missouri, those are my two favorite states to talk about, besides Florida. Um, <laughs> Missouri does not have early voting. They don't allow any early voting in Missouri. They also don't have mail ballot voting. So to get a mail ballot, you have to have a doctor's note, a, notary, a notarized document from your workplace that you will be out of town on election day. And you have to have that in by the Friday before election day. So if you have a death in your family in an emergency over the weekend before election day, you're basically out of luck. They do not have something to offer you for service. So Missouri, 99% is on election day. So you imagine the target that is sitting there on all of those offices. All you'd have to do is pull down a county website to completely disrupt their election day or 
have a threat get thrown out to one of their polling places or their election offices. So we also all talk, always talk about mitigating risk in elections. And that's the other thing that we tried to do with the policy is it's kind of amazing. We were able to better serve voters while also <laughs> mitigating significant risks that existed in our infrastructure, in our systems, and how we were operating with regards to elections. I think that's totally right. I, the, our, the way that we do our system, we have dispersed our risk. Mm -hmm. We've dispersed it over time, and we have multiple ways in which you can vote. If you don't get your ballot in the mail, come on down to a VSPC. If you didn't have time in the two weeks prior to the election, hey, that's fine, come on down on election day. I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which you can vote, and what that does is it means most of our voters have voted before election day. In fact, in the last election, only 5% of our voters voted on election day going to a VSPC. And because of that, if we went down on election day, let's say nothing worked. You know, the entire internet went down for the state of Colorado that day, or no electricity in Colorado for that day. Well, we still have 95% of our ballots in. We could really have great confidence that we've got the right winners in almost every race. But in other states, Missouri is a great example, I like to use New Hampshire because they basically are doing elections like the Greeks did 3,000 years ago. This is, that when, when, they, when they have a problem on election day, that's, you know, they, they have a huge problem. They've got to redo that election. They have no choice. They've got to completely upend it and do, do it again. Um, in Colorado, we don't have that problem. Yeah, and, and I'll, let me, I'll tell the story of New York City on this point too because they, don't, they have very limited early voting and they have uh, pretty much no mail ballot voting. It's actually pro prohibited in their constitution. So yeah, to change right. the law, they actually have to pass it. They passed a bill in their legislative cycle this year that included some of these components, early voting and mail ballot voting. They have, their legislature has to pass that again next year by two thirds. Then they have to send it to the people to vote to ratify before any of that can be implemented. So it's gonna take them from now through 2021 to actually make a change in New York. And the reason that that matters, right, is New York is a, an interesting place. I mean, they have, they have one of the large, you know, largest cities in America. And so last year, New York City, um, and you can Google this if you want to, but they had a major meltdown on election day. And a lot of people don't know about that because that's not, it's not a swing state. So it doesn't pop up in a lot of the, the news. But if you look at the news out of New York uh, last year on, on election day, they had five, six, seven hour lines across the city. That's an entire day for people, right? Um, and I can only imagine how many people walked away from that because they had to pick their kids up or they had to get back to work or whatever. But they had five, six hour, uh, seven hour lines. And the reason was not because the voters needed to get checked in and get a ballot. They have all paper ballots there. They got through the lines, got checked in on the paper poll books or the electronic poll books, voted their ballots, none of the scanners. So they were precinct scanning, tabulating ballots at each location. The precinct scanners all malfunctioned for the most part across the city. So voters were, had already voted and were waiting in line to just put their ballot into the scanner. We don't scan at locations like that in, Den in Colorado. Mm -hmm. we, s we centrally count everything at every county main office. They have, by having that, they had a significant operational breakdown all on election day, nothing really to do about it other than to have people try to convince people to stay there. Um, but it's a good example of what happens when you kind of put everything on election day and people would say, well, no, they just need paper ballots. They had paper ballots and they just weren't dealing with it operationally in the right way. Uh, and and so. you might ask, what's the turnout consequence of having a secure system which gives voters more choice like this? Yeah. The turnout consequence is Colorado had the second highest turnout in the 2018 election, uh, only behind Minnesota, which I hate Minnesota because they always beat us. They, for whatever reason, they always have the highest turnout in the country. In 2016, also under this model, we had the second highest turnout in the country. Um, we, in 2000, before we did virtually any of this, we were middle of the pack. We were 24th in the country, just barely above the average. And over time, as we've done the, implemented these strategies, these implemented these um, both more secure and then more voter-oriented strategies, 
um, we've gone from middle of the pack to the best in the country, minus Minnesota, which. Minnesota you know, had two competitive Senate races. They had two, so that's right. And they beat us by 1.3%. <laughs> so um, uh, we'll, we'll have a competitive Senate race this next year. Maybe we'll, yeah. we'll beat them. So we'll see. So, yeah, and the, and the turnout, so Colorado, you know, we mail a ballot to everyone, and now there's, you know, there's two, been two other states that have been doing that. Now we're up to actually more states that are doing that. So Hawaii just passed uh, a vote-by-mail system. They're one of the lowest states in the country for turnout. Utah is now 100% um, vote-by-mail, so they mail a ballot out to everyone. They also have same-day registration. Nebraska has a lot of counties that are now mailing ballots to everyone. North Dakota has about 31 counties that do it. Um, and then California passed basically a legislation modeled off of Colorado. They brought a delegation here, toured our process uh, a few years ago, and I actually flew out to Sacramento and did some testimony. But they, uh, they passed this, and, and ha about half of their voters are going to get a ballot automatically in the mail next year, which is so significant because California has also been in this sort of middle of the road with turnout and they've really struggled in places like LA where the lines are long and it's very difficult to kind of get around. So um, these, these reforms in all of those states for next year are gonna be really interesting to watch because they are new, it's gonna be a presidential race and a lot of these states are fairly middle of the road turnout wise. Um, Colorado, Oregon and Washington, when you just factor their turnout together last year, they're 14 points higher than the national average. So the national average was, uh, or the voting, um, voting eligible population was about 49.4%. So again, not even 50% of voters voted last year across the country. But our collective states were at about 64. Uh, so th that's a significant difference, but that's simply just us putting a ballot in people's hands, making it easier, making it convenient, while also making it secure. So, so we're out of time, is there a time or interest in doing a couple of questions? I see hands. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, me again. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we're probably all familiar with the Chicago mantra, vote early, vote often. So having said that, you've addressed predominantly the output accuracy of the voting in environment. I'm very interested in what the state is doing or what your feelings are about the validation of a qualified ballot. Would you address that, please? Yeah, sure. So uh, the way that I like to describe our system is, is we actually now have multiple checks, integrity checks within the system that a lot of states like Illinois, and I'm from Illinois, and I appreciate the, the, the knock on Chicago. Um, <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a reason a lot of us are moving out of, out of <laughs> Illinois. Um, but uh, no, it's a beautiful city. Um, <laughs> But you know our system with the way we've done registration, so when we did this reform, we did a comprehensive reform. So we updated our registration processes, created automatic ways of updating addresses, and we do that in a few ways. We can do it at motor vehicle. There's now gonna be some implementations with human services and some other agencies that'll come on board to that. And we also do it with national change of address database through the post office. So when you move and you fill out that change of address, either online or at the post office, Colorado consumes that information within two weeks, and we update your address automatically without you ever having to fill out a form. Same thing happens now at DMV with automatic registration. So that all is automated. So we're getting the most accurate addresses immediately, right? A lot of states are not, don't have systems like that in place. So that's that integrity of the voter registration file. Who, who are the voters? Where are they? What are their addresses? What are their eligible addresses that they're at? We've, all, we've basically modernized that to make it more accurate. So when we go to, um, and then the other piece of that, and I'll, Judd will talk about this, but Eric, and I'll, you, you should definitely talk about that. But the, um, the other part of that is once we kind of make sure all the lists are accurate, then we run that file you know, one more time before we cut the mail ballot file for printing. So we check all those addresses again. Then we mail the ballots out. Well, the mail ballots go to your address that can't be forwarded. So we've just verified your addresses and updated what we needed to, then mailed you a ballot. If you're no longer there within that couple weeks that we did that, 
that's going to come back to us, and now you have to take action as a voter to get a ballot. You either have to come in person, or you have to call us and update your address, right? So that's that address check, essentially, so checking the eligibility. Then when the ballots come back in, we do signature verification. Um, now, I don't know how many in this room had, you know, because I always get the question of, well, isn't photo ID better? I don't know how many people had a fake ID in their college life or at any point, um, but it's a lot easier actually to get all those IDs now. You can order them online. You can do all those things. So the people that argue that photo ID makes this system more secure are, uh, do not have it right. We have seen plenty of issues like that over time where that has not been something that we needed to validate someone's um, eligibility. Signature, however, and I, my sister looks a lot like I do. She could use my ID easily. But the way that you tell us apart is signature. Uh, so we capture every signature, everything that you sign with us, whether it's DMV, form, mail ballot, you know, signature card, anything that you've done. You might have 30 signatures on file here. We I have 26. 26. I, yes. So we check the most recent one. If it doesn't match, we go to the next one. And that's done by a bipartisan team which is really important because that's not something that happens in other states. Uh, so that's kind of like all those checks. And if your signature doesn't match, we ask you for a copy of your ID, and we ask you to fill out an affidavit to validate that. So that's kind of how that works. I hope, did that answer your question? OK. And then Eric, Eric is yeah. the Electronic Registration Information Center. It's a consortium now of 28 states plus the District of Columbia. Uh, in 2012, it was seven states. Colorado was the first state to pay, to join, and we, were all, we all started on July 1 of 2012. Uh, what we do is uh, we send our voter list and our DMV list to Eric every month. They look at all of the lists of all of the states, and they, te they tell us, hey, it sure looks like Amber McReynolds lived in Denver, but now a new one that has her same social security number and her same birth date has popped up in Oregon. So maybe she's moved there now. You should really reach out to her and ask her, do you live in Oregon now? And that's what we do. We send them a mailing. And we send a mailing to Amber, and we invite her to go online to our online voter registration and cancel her registration because she doesn't live here anymore. And if she doesn't do that, hey, that's fine. We've got the MVRA. We've got the National Voter Registration Act, which allows us to um, not cancel you, but to uh, put you in an inactive status for two election cycles, and at the end of those two election cycles, we can cancel you under federal law. But we invite the voter to do that cancellation. Eric also sends us uh, the SSDI, the Social Security Death Index, each month, and we compare that, or it's compared through Eric, to our voter registration database so we can identify all the people who have died in Colorado over that time. We also get a state list, so we get the state list from uh, CDPHE, and we get our federal list, and those two lists encompass pretty much everybody who could have been one of our voters who's died. We cancel those people automatically. And then we also do the in-state check that uh, Amber was referencing on NCOA. So the NCOA comes through our ERIC participation. So ERIC is this fantastic um, outgrowth of the desire on the part of different states to work together to clean their lists. So that when we do those mailings, we're not mailing a bunch of ballots of people that don't live there anymore. Um, in fact, in 2010, yeah. our, um, our mail rejection rate, so um, these are um, ballots that were sent out that are, were rejected by the USPS because they, the people didn't live there anymore, was over 9%. So 9% of the ballots we sent out were rejected. Now we're under 3%. And it's because of all of this activity that we've done, which was largely a consequence of the bill, mm -hmm. uh, 1303, uh, which Amber had a huge role in doing. She probably wrote it, but don't, don't, <laughs> don't tell anybody that. Um, so it's in many respects because of good policies that we've been able to develop um, some of these you know, um, protections on the you know, backside. So the, the protections that aren't about outcome, they're about, you know, how the process works. Those were really long answers. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name's Beth McCann. I am, no, it's not. You're it's not Beth McCann. Story. But I do have a prosecutor related question, but first an observation. It sounds like the description you give of where we were and where some other states are, it feels like it's more party focused than voter focused and then as we move away from that you start to see some of these other things that 
since I'm part of a party, and I know everyone at this table is over here too, that, that's a difference maker, I think, in terms of thinking. I like that. My prosecutor question is this. Where are those areas that remain a vulnerability for potential fraud? Mm -hmm. And what do you do when you come across them? To whom do you refer them? Do you re refer them to the super expert and very good looking local prosecutors? <laughs> Or do you send them to some bureaucratic state agency without really the skill set to handle them? I'm just wondering. Uh, well, so let me jump on this. The, um, the one area that mail ballot doesn't work quite as well, which uh, we're trying to build in some protections, is you could register in multiple states. So if you have the ability to register, let's say you can declare a residence in both Oregon and in Colorado. Well. Um, you could potentially, based on the fact that you now are registered in two states, you could get a ballot mailed to you in both of those states, vote both of those ballots, and we in Colorado would not know that you voted a, a ballot in Oregon. And as long as it's the same election, that's a violation of federal law. So that's something that can happen and frankly does happen, but it happens in very small numbers. The great thing about Eric that I just mentioned is we're in a consortium with 28 states with the District of Columbia, and we're comparing now. So we're comparing who voted in the last election. In fact, I'm involved in that right now. This is, I've got a meeting about that this afternoon where we're gonna talk about the lists that we're getting back that we're comparing from other states. And the number is much smaller than I think you would hope for. I mean, it's a very small number of uh, people who are potentially voting across state lines. Um, interestingly, they tend to be people who are quite well off because they have property in multiple states. I mean, frankly, that's not something that happens a lot. Uh, they tend to be older. Um, they are not college students. You would anticipate maybe it would be college students. It tends to not be college students. So it's, it's an interesting bag of folks and what happens is when we, get, when we do our analysis, we turn that over to the FBI. The FBI goes and knocks on their door, um, has a conversation with them. It usually goes something like, hey, it looks like you may have voted in two states um, in the same election. That's a violation of federal law. We're going to need to talk about that. And they say, oh my god, I had no idea. I thought I was permitted to vote because I have residence in two states. My bad. I'll never do it again. Um, they never do it again. If they do show up on a list the next cycle or in a future cycle, they get turned over to the FBI and then those get federally prosecuted. We've had a couple of those. Um, we also have some states, uh, Arizona, Kansas in the past, have been more aggressive with those first offenders and have prosecuted them. So uh, we have a history of, in the last, in 2016, we turned over 25 to 30 cases to, but we turn them over to our uh, local district attorneys, so you receive some of them. Congratulations. And I know you did something with those cases. Some, some uh, district attorneys uh, deprioritize those, uh, but many prioritize them. So, um, um, you know, Arapahoe County and uh, Douglas County, El Paso County, Boulder County all prioritize those um, prosecutions. Do you have anything? Yeah, and then the, the ones, so. That's sort of what happens at the state level post-election, but the issues that come up at the local level, we refer over to the district attorney. Um, I know that there was a case post-2016, um, former state party chair and radio host uh, got prosecuted for voting his ex-wife's ballot who'd moved out of the house um, after he talked cool. about how another party was going to commit fraud on the radio. So that's sort of interesting. Um, but he got prosecuted in the Weld County, by the Weld County DA. Um, and, and, and honestly, I think when those, when bad actors in North Carolina, we just had a, they had to redo an election because it wasn't voter fraud, it was election fraud committed on the voters. People were saying they were going to drop people's ballots off and discarding their ballots, so they were getting tossed. Um, but that was, that was on the voters, that wasn't the voters doing it. It was sort of committed to the voters. And so I feel like we see a lot more of that where a, a, a mailer will go out that will have like the wrong information telling a voter to do something. And like we have no idea who it is, so we can't really prosecute them doing that. Or a robocall will go out and say, election day is November 7th when it's really November 6th. And you can't like, 
figure out who those entities are that are doing that. But those sorts of things, I think, are a bigger problem than anything that an individual voter yep. does, at least I've seen in my experience, is sort of what's done to voters to either cause confusion, create issues, create mistrust, create distrust, any of that. So does that answer? Do we have time for more questions? No. I'm getting the. Uh, no. Did he say no? Um, well, thank, thank you very much. We appreciate your time and yeah, interest. You.